Hello everyone and welcome to CRAM Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Crumb Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. And I think last month we talked about a couple of limitations of randomized controlled trials. In fact, I've got a slide here uh, that is a summary of the previous talk. And we talked about how some of the results of RCTs may not be generalizable. And uh, we talked about that with an example from a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, on the role of um, iodine uh, in low risk thyroid cancer. And we talked about how results of RCTs are not often in sync with results of observational studies or even database studies. And we talked about how with RCTs, um, there is a significant uh, obstacle in studying long-term outcomes and how sometimes short-term outcomes might favor one treatment while long-term outcomes may favor the other treatment. So those are the things we talked about uh, as, as some important limitations of RCTs. And, uh, and today I thought we should talk about uh, the so-called trial effects in RCTs. And I'll start off by giving you an example and I might just give you one minute to um, write in the chat box what you could, uh, what you see as the potential reasons for uh, for a particular observation. I'll explain that in a second. So let's just imagine that you, you are either designing or you're conducting uh, a multicentered RCT uh, where you're comparing laparoscopic um, surgery versus robotic surgery for colorectal cancer, and you're really interested in um, disease-specific survival and perhaps quality of life as well. And then you've done this uh, uh, big study involving say multiple centers in the, in the United Kingdom. And, and uh, let's then see uh, the outcomes in patients who are taking part in the trial, regardless of whether they have the lap or the robotic surgery, versus patients who for various reasons uh, are not in the trial. Either the patients didn't want to take part or the clinicians thought um, they're probably not suited for the trial or they just didn't meet the eligibility criteria. And uh, let's assume that the trial showed, as many trials do show, that, um, or your analysis showed that trial participants seem to do better than non-trial participants. So it's not to do um, with whether they had laparoscopic surgery or robotic surgery, but just overall patients within trials uh, have done better than patients that are outside of trials. Now, uh, why, uh, why do you think um, this would be? What are the potential reasons why trial patients uh, are doing better than non-trial patients? Um, do you mind just putting whatever your thoughts are in the chat box and maybe Gio can summarize? Hawthorne effect, um, yeah. Uh, I'll come to, I'll explain the Hawthorne effect um, in a bit. And then people with motivation and, and uh, yeah, concerns about the health may have other attributes that uh, make them uh, uh, generally fitter, more tolerant of treatment and stronger. And therefore these are the, probably the patients who will be in trials. Yeah, that's good. Any other reasons? So they, they can be a number of different reasons and that's what we're gonna talk about now. So um, what would help is um, trying to categorize or box these reasons into two major categories, right? So the first um, category is what I would uh, refer to as the cohort effects. Um, yeah, this, this were some more uh, reasons in the chat box, that's good. So uh, what do I mean by cohort effects? By cohort effects, I simply mean that there could be differences in, between the patients in the trials and patients uh, outside of trials. And that could be because of the eligibility criteria. Patients have to meet certain eligibility criteria before they can be uh, 
before they can take part in the trial. There could be uh, some factors that are not really documented whereby the clinicians are a bit concerned about patients entering into this trial. Some patients, some clinicians might think that this patient is neither suitable for laparoscopy nor robotic uh, and therefore might be unwilling to enter them into the trial or may not have uh, broached the topic of trial participation. And sometimes patients for various reasons uh, might just not want to take part in the trial. They might be suspicious of getting involved in trials and so on and so forth. So you know these reasons. So these are all uh, reasons how non-trial participants can somehow be quite different to trial participants despite having you know, colorectal cancer and despite having various other similarities. So there could be differences between cohorts, yeah? The other um, set of uh, reasons are grouped under the category of trial effects. So um, under this category, there are four distinct um, points to consider. One is that for one reason or the other, the trial participants get better treatments or better care. The other reason is uh, what we refer to as the protocol effect, and I'll explain that in a second. Then comes the Hawthorne effect, which um, uh, one of you mentioned, and finally the placebo effect. So what we'll do in the next few slides is to go through each of these trial effects uh, in the context of the example we've just discussed. So the example is uh, a multi-centered RCT comparing lap versus robotic surgery. So what, what about different treatments and differences in care? So it could be that patients in the trial um, uh, allocated to either robotic or laparoscopic surgery um, are likely to get their surgery from expert high volume surgeons. It could be that the trial itself stipulates that if you um, are getting into the trial and having robotic surgery, then the surgeon should have done 20 procedures or something like that. Or the surgeon should be a high volume surgeon doing more than 10 or 20 or 30 laparoscopic surgeries a year. And that may not necessarily be the case for non-trial participants. It could be that a trial patients had more frequent follow-ups as, as you mentioned before. And it could also be that trial patients have more contact with research staff, more uh, often minor discrepancies in results are picked up while filling in the trial documentation. Uh, you know, uh, you're more likely to act upon these uh, minor issues that are picked up in the labs or on scans. And then uh, those um, factors might influence um, outcomes such as survival and quality of life. The next uh, kind of trial effect is the so-called protocol effect. Uh, as you probably already know, trial patients uh, are subject to a very well-defined set of instructions, or um, we call that the protocol. And this pro protocol could stipulate how surgery is done, sometimes steps of surgery, specific aspects of preoperative care and, uh, and postoperative care. And um, all of that dotting the I's and crossing the T's um, in terms of following the protocol um, will potentially favor the participants in the trial. Sometimes trial protocol mandates extensive screening for sepsis and other risk factors for perioperative morbidity that you may not necessarily do in the average non-trial patient. And the protocol often mandates um, quite rigidly when adjuvant treatment has to be uh, initiated, when patients have to be followed up. And this is not often the case in our bog standard NHS patient where logistics and resource, resource constraints uh, can um, often influence when the patient gets their adjuvant treatment, unfortunately. So these are all uh, referred to as the protocol effect. The next effect is what you've uh, you mentioned, one of you mentioned the Hawthorne effect. So I'll give a bit of a background. So uh, essentially the Hawthorne effect refers to the phenomenon or the impact of the awareness of being observed on the behavior of either the, the trial participants or the treatment or care providers like the surgeons. So it was first described by a chap called Landsberger in the US who looked at data um, from a number of studies done on a uh, factory in Chicago, the Hawthorne Works, in the 1920s and 1930s. And what they did is they evaluated the impact of different interventions on the output of, the, of their workers. And the interventions would be things like giving them breaks, five minute or 10 minute breaks, giving them snacks or food at breaks, shortening the work days, 
changing the illumination in the factory and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing is that regardless of the nature of the intervention or the direction of the intervention, output would increase in the factory. And this has been attributed to changes in the behavior of the workers as a result of their knowledge that they're being observed and their output is, and their, um, their production, the, the producers being counted. So there's been a lot of debate on the design of these studies and how the data has been interpreted and several other factors other than this impact on behavior has been postulated. But however, um, this is a really important effect and has got significant parallels in medical literature. So coming back to um, uh, medical literature then, um, interestingly, there's been a study on uh, and the Hawthorne effect, a direct assessment of the Hawthorne effect, not in surgical literature, I have to say, but in uh, neuropsychiatric literature, whereby what they did was um, they got hold of uh, a big group of patients with dementia and they randomized the patients to a herbal product called ginkgo biloba. It's a basically a supplement from um, a, uh, a plant species uh, that is native in China. Um, and they gave and the randomized patients to either receiving this herbal supplement or placebo. And they also randomized in a two by two factorial design uh, the same group of patients to either receiving intensive follow up or minimal follow up. And they, at the end of the study, they looked at cognition. And the interesting thing is that the herbal supplement did not affect cognition, but the cognition was improved in the group of patients who had intensive follow-up. And by intensive follow-up, basically meant more frequent assessments um, uh, of the patients. And the authors argued that this was evidence of the Hawthorne effect in that the participants knew they were being observed more closely and being monitored, and they're doing the best to um, put up, you know, and come up with a better sort of uh, cognitive performance. Right, so, Back to our example, laparoscopy versus robotic surgery for colorectal cancer. So how could the Hawthorne effect be applicable here? Now, surgeons, if they are being aware of the scrutiny associated with uh, the trial, it is possible that the um, expert surgeons or the senior surgeons did most of the operation and didn't uh, allow or give much of the operating to the trainees. It is possible that they paid more attention to every step in the operation consciously or subconsciously. And it's not just the surgeons, but also the anesthetists, the physiotherapists, the intensivists um, may have potentially provided, um, you know, um, provided more attention and followed the various aspects of perioperative care a bit more rigidly because they know that all of the outcomes and the interventions are being documented and scrutinized as part of the trial. So, um, so you can see how the Hawthorne effect can play a significant role, um, not in biasing uh, and causing differences between um, the lap and robotic arm, but just um, increasing the chance of a better outcome in patients taking part in the trials overall, regardless of the arm to which they have been randomized to. Uh, the next, uh, the final effect, uh, the trial effect is the so-called placebo effect. I'm sure you all heard of the placebo effect, which essentially um, refers to uh, the phenomenon that patients do well um, because they perceive that they're getting new treatment, a novel intervention. They've been looked after more. They've been followed up very carefully. They've got the contact of the clinical uh, no specialists and the research nurses. So um, regardless of whether they're getting a laparoscopic or robotic arm, um, they might feel that uh, they're getting a specialist or additional treatment. Now, um, there's not much in the uh, surgical literature with regards to, the, uh, to empiric data on trial effects in surgical trials, uh, but it is a good... Uh, um, a study in the medical literature, um, and then I've provided the link there, um, where they looked at patients, uh, HIV positive patients who participated in trials of highly active antiretroviral viral therapy and compared these patients to patients 
with HIV who did not take part in the HAART uh, trials, but received routine clinical care, which would have included uh, these antiretroviral agents. And they found really good evidence and that there was a, a difference in the viral load in that patients within trials did better and had a much reduced viral load compared to patients outside of trials, regardless of what treatment they received. Right, I wanted to conclude by just mentioning the halo effect. The halo effect is different to the trial effects we've discussed uh, so far. Um, I was, um, uh, also under the false impression that the halo effect is also a kind of trial effect, and that is not the case. Essentially, it's a phenomenon whereby uh, you have a single trait and you take that as being reflective of other attributes uh, in a particular patient or person or thing. Now, a classic example would be, uh, you know, a smartly dressed person uh, at an interview being perceived somehow to be better at his or her job based on their presentation and appearance. Uh, whereas we all know that that's not necessarily the case. And so how does that um, have an influence on surgical research? So in relation to surgical research, one of the things um, that may impact on your perception of how good a study is, is the journal's impact factor. Like the um, article we've discussed today, um, the paper is published in the British Journal of Surgery. It's got a very high impact factor. So even before you read the paper, you may um, attribute uh, a high level of importance to the paper simply because it got published in the British Journal of Surgery. Um, typically, if you see a randomized controlled trial in the Annals of Surgery, which has, a, which has a very high impact factor, you're probably going to pay a lot more attention to it than if you come across a RCT in the Annals of Royal College of Surgeons of England. And I wouldn't blame you for that. But you've got to keep uh, in mind that there is a bias there. And um, um, there's been an interesting study in, uh, in, in sepsis, in sepsis literature, where authors essentially evaluated a number of factors that influence subsequent citations. And they found that journal impact factor, not the study design, or not another sort of um, measure of quality, but it was a journal impact factor that was an independent predictor of subsequent citations of those individual studies, which goes to show that uh, there's clear evidence that um, uh, there is halo effect and that journal impact factor does significantly influence more than study design, uh, does significantly influence what readers think of uh, an individual study. And th th that's a paper there, a link to the paper if you're interested. Right, so I'll summarize. Um, so uh, essentially, you've got to keep in mind that there's uh, a lot of evidence out there that just participating in the clinical trials, regardless of which arm you get into, the, the placebo arm or the standard arm or the intervention arm, um, on average, patients seem to do better in many scenarios, not in all scenarios, but many scenarios, they seem to be doing better than non-trial participants. And this could be due to a variety of reasons. It could be very simply that these are very different patients. So that's what we refer to as the cohort effects, but it could also be due to uh, the so-called trial effects, which as we have uh, just discussed, uh, you can summarize as uh, the effects of different treatments or care, and the effects of following a rigid protocol, uh, the Hawthorne effect, the fact that people are being observed, and the placebo effect, patients uh, thinking that they are in the trial and probably therefore everything is being done as per a probably a higher standard. And finally, remember the halo effect uh, when you're coming across papers and when you're looking at what journal the paper got published in. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.